Well, Megan, I've been wearing Vionic shoes for over three years now, but this month, my trusted shoe brand and I entered a new phase of our relationship, international travel. Well, Sarah, that is a serious commitment, (laughs) right? You can't just pack any shoe for a trip abroad. It's got to be stylish enough for those major cosmopolitan cities. It's got to be sturdy enough for trains, planes, buses, and city streets. And obviously, it's got to be comfortable enough to support your feet over many, many miles of walking. Well, no surprise, my Vionics were up to the task. I had two pair with me, a pair of casual sneakers in a cool gray color, and then a weatherproof suede ankle boot that I swear still looks brand new after 10 days on soggy sidewalks. Megan, the only time my feet hurt the entire trip was New Year's Eve when I made the mistake of wearing a pair of booties not from Vionic. So I'll just leave that data right here for you. Okay, well, that's pretty conclusive, Sarah. Vionic has the best curated styles to get you ready for whatever 2024 has in store, whether it's jet setting like Sarah or keeping up with busy mom life on this side of the pond. They even offer a 30 day guarantee, wear them, love them or return them for a full refund within 30 days. And we've got a great deal for you. Use code the mom hour 15 at checkout for 15% off your entire order at vionicshoes.com when you log into your account. That's a one time use only. Bionic Shoes, wearable well-being for your feet. Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour everyone, and welcome to episode 244 of The Mom Hour. I'm Sarah Powers here with Megan Francis. Hey, Megan. Hey, Sarah. So we are talking about food today, feeding a family, feeding our families. Um, We are at the beginning of the year here. And Megan, I don't know. It just feels like we can revisit this topic a million times because kids grow, families change. But we're always we're all trying to be a little bit better, a little more intentional about how we treat food and eating in our homes, right? Yeah. And I feel like it also is almost seasonally changes Um, Mm -hmm. as the school year waxes and wanes and different activities and all those things. um, I finally I feel like I'm always reinventing this part of my life. So happy to talk about it today. It is. It's a fun topic. I feel like I've actually learned a lot from you on this just because your kids are older than mine. And when I was in the stage of, you know, breastfeeding a baby, cutting up grapes for a toddler and like packing these little preschool lunches, that was when I really, you know, got to know you. And I feel like you were writing and talking about this more broad concept that I think of as like food values or like food Mm -hmm. culture in your family. And I'm being, this is totally sincere. I think I've like really emulated that about you. And it's helped me not, not stress over the granular decisions of like whole wheat or white or this or that. Um, but more like what are the attitudes around food, eating, cooking meals in a much better, bigger, more holistic sense that I want to like slowly build in my family. Not like we're overhauling it, but just like, what am I, what am I striving for? So I think that's at least where we're going to focus the first half of today's show on. And I I credit that a lot to you. Well, thank you. And I love that. I think it's really hard. And it's uh, especially when your children are really little, so much of the advice and information that you absorb about feeding them is so ingredients based (laughs) and like preparation based. And it's gotten worse. I mean, like even (laughs) since my kids were little, now the idea that everyone, like everything can be solved with diet, mm. it's like become prevalent times a thousand. I it think it would be a very stressful time to be trying to figure that out. And I think the approach I decided to take was like food is food. And if we're eating a lot of it at home, it's going to be pretty good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Regardless, if we're making it, even if it's simple stuff, um, it's it's probably going to be nutritious enough for my family. So what is the thing I really want to focus on, which is creating this food culture that they can then take with them into the rest of their life? Yeah. And it's also such a much more fun place to approach food from, because when I think of food culture, I think of things like family recipes and memories Mm. around food and all of the social and like connective aspects to food and eating, which to me is just more fun and interesting than, I totally agree. than obsessing over ingredients. And you're so right. In today's culture, it's almost like moms are expected to be a registered dietitian or a nutrition yeah. expert for their own family. And then we have things like food allergies and food sensitivities. And um, it, it's not to take away from, it's great to become educated and to become an advocate for your family and your child, uh, but it's a lot of work. 
So yes. um, I think that's where always where we've come down to with talking about food. Um, and that's where, so in the first half of today, we're going to kind of reset with some, uh, uh, let's see, some like food intentions or food truths that we hope to have for our family, a little bit aspirational because we're not perfect. Um, and then in the second half, we'll just talk more in detail about what's working right now with feeding our families and what needs maybe a reset for 2020. But I thought um, this would be a good time, Megan, for you to share like a little bit about your move that's My coming situation. up and how that yes. affects how you feed your family. Okay, I'm going to get to that in just a second, but I want to share a really quick story because yeah. you mentioned family recipes. Um, so, you know, my sister-in-law, Jenna, her grandma died a few months back and she was in her 90s. So, okay. and they had been doing family holidays together for years and years and years with the whole extended family. And so this year they all made one of her favorite. So they didn't have a traditional Christmas dinner. Okay. They all made one of her oh. favorite, you know, like kind of staple dishes. And one of them was, I just remember Jenna telling me this, like pizza chicken. And I think it was literally like <laughs> chicken breasts with like, pizza sauce yeah. dumped all over it or something and cheese. Just one of those probably like holdovers from the 50s and 60s. Yeah, it was probably a clipping that, from a magazine or something. Yes. Yeah. And I just love that because it's like, imagine, you know, yourself, your family now, 60 years from now yes. or 50 years from now, making whatever the thing is that's that version yes. of whatever the thing is that you make that lasts that long and is the thing that comes out every year. Like to me, that's what it's all about. Is pizza chicken the most healthful food? Yeah. No, but I bet it's not that bad. <laughs> Honestly, that and is, it's that's yeah, <laughs> it's so amazing and so many like great memories and yeah, that's, like it's it's just yeah, I love that. I, yeah. No, I have a really quick story about family recipes. Sure. I was with multi generations of my mom's side, including my grandma, who's ninety one and doing well. Um, and at my parents' house, and um, we have a Swedish pancake recipe that's been passed down. We actually call them Swedish hotcakes. I think that comes because there's lots of cowboys in my side of the family, and that's like mm. a cowboy word. But it, they're Swedish pancakes, like the kind you know, you might get at a recipe. I want that recipe because I have a really hard time finding a good, um, yeah. a good recipe for that. And they're so, hard yes. to make. And we use a cast mm -hmm. iron skillet and they're not hard. The ingredients are simple, but the technique is a little, takes a little bit. And I made them, but I was the third of four generations there. So my mom and my aunt were there, the generation above me, my grandma was there. And then of course my kids and my nieces and um, my gra I, I served my grandma. She's in a wheelchair and and I overheard her saying she wanted another one. And, you know, she's 91. Like they don't, they don't eat a ton. And then I brought it over to her and she's like, these are the best I've ever had. And I was like, oh my grandma, gosh. this is your recipe. Right. But it was like and I, I oh. really do think she meant it. And I was kind of proud because there's a little competitiveness, like who can make a, like who's who's really like got the chops, who's really Swedish. Yeah. And um, it was oh, really cute. It. it was a very genuine compliment. I don't know if it like is truly the best ones she's ever had, but it was very well, cute. Well, today, that day she that felt day. like it was and that matters. And I yes, owned I it. I love that. <laughs> All right. Well, I will tell you a little bit about how my life is about to drastically change. So we're moving. Um, by the time this airs, I think the move will be pretty much over um, or at least mostly done. Mid move. Mid move. And we are moving from the house we've lived in for the last almost two years is itty bitty. Um, you've seen it, Sarah. It's teeny. Mm -hmm. And the living kitchen space is really more like an apartment. Like it's a shared living and dining area mm -hmm. and then a small galley kitchen with like one place to prep food, one cabinet for a pantry. Yeah. Um, you can't open the fridge and the dishwasher at the same time. You really can't have two people in there working at the same time. So I had come from this place where the, the kitchen was like the hangout mm -hmm. and that was where everyone did their homework and talked to me while I cooked. And, um, and I really had to kind of adjust my expectations and my routines for the new reality. And the good news is I really did a pretty good job. Like I really figured out a way and we'll talk about this a little bit more when we're talking about shopping and, but I really figured out a way to shop for such a small space yeah. and not be overwhelmed and not then it helped me get food waste under control. Like there was some things that it sure. really worked well but the place I'm moving into has a big island, oh. tons of cabinet space, a walk-in pantry. Um, like it's huge compared to what I've been working with. And I am just so excited because now I feel like I can take some of this streamlining and simplifying I did back into this new space and really make the most of it yes. and have that that kind of kitchen hour again, like I used to do where I really hung out in the kitchen all evening long and I would do everything in the kitchen. And now it's like, I just get in and get out because there's no space. Like there's nothing to do in there after a certain amount of time. So well, I'm really looking forward to that. And that's going to inform everything about 2020 and how I approach food. I love this so much. And for new listeners, you divorced a little before you moved. So you've really never had any other kitchen in your post-divorce life other than right. this tiny one. You were still yes. living in the house um, that you shared with John for a while. Yeah. 
but that's that's a little different. So this mm-hmm. the little house was your first post divorce house of your own, and so I'm just thinking of all the ways your your schedule and your kids' schedule and like your the way your life is set up is so different yeah. now, and a yes. kitchen to. I really want like a reality show that shows you moving in and like I just want to see where you put everything and I, get I'll organized. be very confused. <laughs> You'll be confused. <laughs> and I scaled, <laughs> yes, I think I'm going to be very confused by how to use this all these cabinets and I got rid of a lot of stuff. Yeah. So uh, luckily the house I'm in now has good um closet space so I did hang on to like all my Pyrex and all that. I didn't like clean house, but I'm going to be like, what? <laughs> all right now, all of my pots and pans are stacked up on each other. So if I want to get one out, yeah. I have to like literally take them all out and get the one at the bottom. You know how it goes. Like, it's just, it's, it's been a challenge. Yeah. So, wow. I'm looking forward to this. I am excited. I'm looking forward to talking about it. Yeah. Sarah, you know, when someone's trying to sell me something, I can be pretty skeptical. Maybe it's my rebel tendencies, but having some healthy doubts has definitely kept me from wasting money on every cool product the algorithm sends my way. You know what's not too good to be true, though? Our sponsor, Ritual, and their clinically backed Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Yeah, Megan, that's so true. We both love these vitamins because they're made with high quality and traceable key ingredients in clean, bioavailable forms. And they're gentle on an empty stomach with a fresh minty essence in every bottle. So you don't have to worry about nausea if you're a bit relaxed about when you take them. I'm also a big fan of Ritual's sustainability standards. They use scientific tools to select lower carbon packaging, prioritize sustainably sourced ingredients, and set ambitious climate goals. No more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. Get 20% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash the mom hour. Start Ritual or add Essential for Women 18 plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash the mom hour for 20% off. We are welcoming back Dr. Mom Butt Balm as a sponsor today. And Megan, I guess you must be back to changing diapers again, right? Now that you have a step grandbaby in the mix. I have changed a few lately, Sarah. And yeah, it really takes me back to that memory from early motherhood. I actually always enjoyed diaper changes unless they were the really gross toddler ones or if there was diaper rash involved. Oh my gosh, yes. I remember being so stressed out, like gearing up for the saddest diaper change ever. Your baby knows it's going to hurt. You know they're going to cry. It is just the worst. And having to use goopy, gross diaper rash cream definitely didn't help. Dr. Mom Butt Balm was developed by a mom who's also a doctor when she couldn't find any traditional products that worked for her baby's persistent diaper rash. This pediatrician-approved formula is made with all quality ingredients and no artificial dyes or preservatives. And since it's easy to remove, you won't have to wipe and wipe to get it off of your baby's skin. That is so important, especially if they're already a little chafed. And I love the way this formula feels. A little goes a long way. Don't let diaper rash come between you and your baby. Shop for Dr. Mom Butt Balm online at Amazon or Walmart today. Okay, so we're going to share some food truths or little um, sayings that we want to kind of guide our family's food culture this year. And I want to be clear, these are some of these are aspirational. It is not Mm. how everything operates every day in our houses, but just think of them as like value statements around food. And I definitely um, I'm writing mine in the present tense as if it is already happening. Um, But that is there's for sure an aspirational aspect to that. So My first one is we are grateful for the work that went into preparing every meal, whether or not we enjoy the food. (laughs) And this this will ring true if you have picky kids or kids who like say this is gross when you put a plate in front of them or you have battles around food. Um, I think something I've tried to do is um, kind of make a distinction between tastes, which tastes evolve for kids and adults. And we're all allowed to have our own tastes and preferences. But being acknowledging that work went into preparing your food is something that I think even little kids can start to grasp if you model it enough and have some structure around it. So I think I shared in a maybe when we talked about table or um, ha- um, manners, I'm not sure, but I know I shared at one point that we we try to always thank the chef and my kids will do that mm. in a cute way, even if the chef. Yeah, we just, just talked about that recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So little, little ways to thank the person who prepared the meal. And I do think my kids are starting to get this. They'll, they'll sort of, they can sort of distinguish between whether or not it's their favorite flavor or taste. Um, and the fact that work went into, and somebody put love and care into preparing it. 
And I think actually this can um, extend even to restaurants or guests. And, mm. or, you know, when you're a guest somewhere, you're going to Thanksgiving somewhere, that the act of preparing food is really like a, a physical way to show love. Um, and that that is, it doesn't have to, it's not one and the same with whether you actually like the food. And so that's yeah. just, the, I, that's how I put it in that statement. I love that. Um, mine kind of dovetails off of that a little bit. And it's that we all have a part to play in making a successful family dinner. And I will admit, this is something I have fallen down on a lot in the current home. I did better in the older house because I was able to have like, I was able to gather my children around right. me <laughs> like, and give them things to do yeah. and, and really make them uh, a part of the process. Whereas in this small house, small kitchen, I've shooed them out most of the time. Mm -hmm. Like I haven't really figured out how to make them part of the experience, whether that's prepping or um, cleaning up afterward. It's just so crowded. It's been, e I've defaulted too many times to that. It's easier just to do it myself thing. Mm -hmm. And I've started to recognize that. And that is something I, I definitely plan to rectify in the new space because everybody does, even if it's a little you know, even if it's a five-year-old setting the table mm -hmm. or a little one putting napkins out, you know, a toddler. I remember doing that with toddlers and preschoolers, like putting napkins at everyone's spot. Um, there's something everyone can do to pull the dinner together and give everyone a little ownership well, over it. I love the way you worded it because we all have a part to play in making a successful family dinner. My first thought was for the kids who aren't helping for some reason, either they're at sports or they are, yeah. you know, doing homework or you just haven't called them to help. Um, a big part of a successful family dinner is coming willingly to the table with your hands mm. washed and sitting there like a, like a human being. And I have right. some children who <laughs> sit like a human being. I <laughs> like, love it th for whom that is the highest the, the expectation. Most that they can do. Yes, is, but yeah. they still have a part to play in a successful family dinner, even if it's not setting the table. I was also thinking about older siblings watching a younger for two minutes, which counts mm. toward so that you can set the table. I mean, all of yeah. that. So I love the way that you kind of broadened that. And it's not that every family is contributing in the ways we might think, but everybody has a part to play. So I really like that. Um, OK, well, my next one is simple. And this is we linger at the dinner table. And as I was thinking about this, we don't always sometimes we cut and run. Um, but my favorite times are now that my kids are getting older, when nobody gets up and rushes off. And I was thinking about the holidays that we just had. And my family does this, too. You know, someone might get up and clear a few plates. But I love the dinners where we linger at the table and there's silly conversations that happen. And it might linger might mean five minutes after everybody's yeah. done. But I come from a line of very fast eaters like I eat really yeah. fast. My kids eat fast. I come from a family who eats fast. And so the actual eating is sometimes over really quickly. And and the work that goes into putting even a really, really simple meal on the table, it feels like, well, then it's over. And um, I don't know, the lingering feels like a little bit of a reward for making it through all those toddler and preschool years where there was yes. there was no lingering. There was no yeah. no one was lingering. And now we do. And I just kind of wanted to state it and make it more of a value because it's I think that those are some of the nicest times. You know what I've actually been thinking about lately is I want to start serving more dessert, oh, even if a it's great idea, even if it's like coffee, tea and fruit. I mean, like some, like whatever yes. it is, just to have a reason for everyone to stay a little longer, because we're also very fast eaters. And there's a lot of chaos with as many people as I have yeah. at the table. And there's a lot. And even with as many people as you have, it's like things are being passed yeah. and everyone's like gobbling at different at different speeds. And so just to have a reason for everyone to stay a little longer. Um, and we've never been a dessert family. We're not a big sweets family, yeah. but I think that's something that maybe not every day, but like maybe a couple times a week, I'd like to have a reason I, to stick around. I love that. And that is totally like, that's a great aspiration for your new kitchen. Cause you could prep yep. something ahead of time. You could make brownies from a box and cut them into little teeny yeah. squares. Like there's a million ways you could do that easily. I really, really yes. like that. Okay. Well, oh, it's so your it's turn. Me. Yeah. Ah, okay. Um, so my next one also kind of goes with the lingering idea because we know what happens when we linger at the dining, the dining room table is that we talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, so mine is that we give everyone a chance to speak and be heard. And that is something that I think, especially in bigger families, but really in any family with multiple people, there's always talkers. And then there's people who get talked over. Yeah. Um, and then there's whoever's getting crapped on. Like there's yeah. always the kid who's the age, maybe usually youngest, but not always. Sometimes it's just someone else who's the butt of the joke that day or whatever. And um, I don't want our dining room, our dining table to be a place where negative family yeah. dynamics 
get a foothold and like play out yeah. or, you know what I mean? Become perpetuated. I want it to be a place where we kind of break those and create better ones. So giving everyone a chance to speak and be heard is important. And it's something that's really pretty simple. I mean, if you're just active about it, you can say, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, Clara was talking. Yeah. Everyone. Yeah. I, it's it's mom being kind of an, and dad being kind of the, the people who keep the flow going. Yes. I, I love this so, so much. I have to share that as the oldest of three and one sibling who was a lot younger, like I have memories of being in junior high when my sister was in a high chair. So like a big, yeah. a big age spread. Um, I have memories of getting interrupted a lot at dinner. Oh, and I think yeah. my parents tried their best, but the age spread and the chaos, and mm-hmm. I'm really sensitive. I'm over, I will say I'm oversensitive to the perception that I'm not being listened to or that I'm being interrupted. And I, I'll just shut down. Like, I just won't talk if I feel like I'm not being listened to. And I, I remember that as a family dinner dynamic. And I don't think it was my parents' fault. I think it was just circumstance and my over, my over sensitivity to it. But I love that my little like 12 year old heart is Aww. feels very seen <laughs> that that's a priority for you. And I think yeah. I think we do this, too. And I would also say that parents deserve a chance to seen to to be heard um, and a chance to speak. And I think interrupting at the, the dinner table, if you're able to get everybody around it, is a great time to model and practice conversation skills. Like I know we're yep. supposed to be talking about food, but that kind of, you know, waiting your turn. And I've had to coach my kids a little bit about they'll ask a question and not listen to the answer. And and they ask really, they're kids, they ask really interesting questions. And Brian and I like to give them interesting answers. And I'm like, guys, you can't ask like, you know, how the political system works and then it not answer. <laughs> then take off. Like, yeah. Yeah, like you have to. And then, you know, we've talked about things like when someone asks you how your day was or asks you about something you might want to ask them in return, like little social things that as they're getting older, we can practice at the dinner table. So I think that's mm. such a good one. I really love that. Yay. Um, well, my next one is more food based and that is just very simply, we try new things and this <laughs> never stops being a goal of mine, um, for trying new foods. Uh, it's really, I, I don't have the most adventurous eaters of kids. I don't think I have the pickiest, but, um, it's not easy and it's very easy as a parent to write off what your kids will and won't eat. And I have not been the best about that. I'm not like a model citizen in this area, but it's still something I strive for. And we've made some good progress in the last year on trying new things. And, you know, the having an attitude or uh, embracing the value that you try new things doesn't mean you have to like everything. It doesn't mean you have to Mm. eat everything on your plate. Um, And I think it can apply to all family members. Like I could, I could expand my horizons by trying new things by trying a new recipe that maybe my kids will like more, you know, like we're all, we're all, we, we never, um, we never stop trying new things. And I think if I sound resigned, it's because I find this very difficult. So it is an aspirational <laughs> value, um, yeah. but it's hard. Um, I totally agree. I have like a couple little hacks that you yeah. may or may not find helpful. One, I really do think, and this is so unfair to mom and dad, but I really do think that if it's somebody else's idea or somebody else's food, uh. it typically <laughs> is more well-received. Yeah. So for example, my kids get really excited about recipes from HelloFresh that um, are outside of my usual wheelhouse. Mm -hmm. And then like once I've made the HelloFresh version, I can make like my own version and somehow it's suddenly more accepted. Mm -hmm. Whereas before, I don't know why that is. It seems very unfair, but it's like HelloFresh did it. Another one that's even even more experimental or or outside the box is taking my kids to ethnic restaurants Mm -hmm. and letting them try stuff at ethnic restaurants first and then making like the most dumbed down version of that at home. So we have like an Indian restaurant that we like to go to. They have a buffet. The kids get to try everything. I mean, honestly, Claire just eats the naan. She she really, (laughs) she maybe puts a tiny little bit of butter chicken on her plate, but then, you know, butter chicken is something I can make at home now Uh and naan and they'll eat it. Whereas if I had just one day been like, yes, I'm going to make this enormous Indian meal. Not that I would be able to make it anyway. Like I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, But we've all now established a comfort level. Yeah in a restaurant where we're all having fun and like the whole idea is that we're experimenting and somehow that's worked for us in a variety of ways. So I love that. And as you were talking, I was thinking it's hard on kids when the pressure is all on the one dinner meal. Like they look down, you've put something in front of them and their little minds go, Oh, I hate this. Or I, I, it's unfamiliar. I don't want to try it. And I was thinking about, I think I, Brian and I are actually good in smaller ways about introducing new flavors Um, But maybe not at the dinner table. So sometimes I'll put out like, especially like fruits and veggies. I'll be like, hey, taste these blueberries and tell me if they're 
you know, are they good enough to keep? Or should I uh, freeze them for a smoothie? Or Brian will do like, hey, come over here. I'm like making a sauce. Let's do a taste test. And so I think if the if the goal is to just have the trying, the tasting, the fun of like mm-hmm. almost a taste test, like, OK, I'm going to put out these different dip hummus dips. Which one do you like best? And like vote for your favorite, like those kinds of making it almost a game or fun and yeah. maybe taking the pressure off like they're still going to want their same old, same old for right. dinner. Right. Exactly. And, you know, when we go to a buffet, like I, I love buffets for this reason, because a lot of like little hole in the wall ethnic restaurants will have buffets and I don't pay any attention to what my kids get. I don't care. Yeah. Like they really could just eat rice the entire yeah. time. And that's fine because <laughs> the point is we're, we're going out to the whole point when we go out is that we're not I'm not working. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, so then it's kind of like sneaky. It's like a sneaky way to like you were just describing, like to get them to try new things without it putting the meal in front of them and going, this is it. Yeah. This yeah. is all you get. So. I want Indian food now. Oh, me too. Gosh, I'm really hungry. Okay. I'm going to stop thinking about naan and butter chicken and Yum. move on. And samosas. That's what I really want mm. right now. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so also to dovetail off, we try new things. The other one, my last one is we celebrate old favorites. And I like this one because I think that it gives whoever's cooking, mom and dad, um, a break, lets us off the hook from always having to reinvent the wheel and mm-hmm. always come up with new, you know, new menus and, and new options. And we recycle a lot of food in my house. Um, and I believe dinner is more, is about more than the food yeah. and giving them a culinary experience. And so, you know, after a while, <laughs> the kids will kind of learn to enjoy that comfort of repetition. And a lot of kids love repetition. Yeah. For a lot of kids, that's not a problem at all. Um, and the ones in mind who would prefer to have something brand new every day have just kind of learned not to complain if it's like stew again. Yeah. Like, and they understand that there's a way you can say something like, oh, yeah. we're having <laughs> meatloaf again. Yeah. That sounds mean. And there's a way that, you know, there's it's sometimes at least like just don't say anything at all yeah. is better. And, and that takes time too yeah. for them to learn. It's another it's another etiquette or manners. Yes. Thing that they learn by through repetition and through modeling. Right. And the older they get, if it's something that they wish weren't on the menu once a week, they could offer to cook a meal. Exactly. Another one. I just remembered another thing that we have sort of like trained our kids to say is instead of saying, how long until dinner? I'm hungry. Um, we have just trained them to say, is there anything I can do to help to get dinner on the table? And they do it like it took years, but it's just that mindset shift of like, if it yeah. feels like it's taking a long time, maybe you should offer to maybe help. Maybe you can and, help. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's yeah. kind of the same thing. If you don't like that meatloaf is on the menu, maybe you would like to offer to cook dinner one night. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Love I it. love it. Um, OK, well, those were great. I'll make sure to write those in the show notes in case anybody's inspired uh, to borrow from us. And um, if you all listening have any food values or kind of statements that guide your family. We would love to hear them as well. Sarah, when my kids were little, I was always pretty torn on whether to give them a daily multivitamin. I knew that modern kids diets have some pretty big nutritional gaps, but I also knew that most children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise. They're filled with sugar. They have all kinds of chemicals and preservatives in them. And I was like, why would I give these to my kids? Luckily, two dads recognized the problem and came up with a solution, Haya, the pediatrician-approved, super-powered, chewable vitamin. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diets to provide the full-body nourishment our kids need with a yummy taste they love. Formulated with the help of nutritional experts, Haya is pressed with a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies, then supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others to help support immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. Your first shipment comes with a cute bottle that has fun stickers your kids can use to decorate it too. My kids always loved that. And we've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, go to HayaHealth.com slash MomHour. This deal is not available on their regular website. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash mom hour and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. Okay, well, this this next section has actually become kind of an accidental recurring theme, but I really like it when we do this. We're going to talk about a couple of things that are currently working in our homes as it relates to feeding a family, and then we'll offer one or two that need a reset. And I, we've kind of accidentally started doing this on different topics. Um, and I, the reason I like this is because 
we've been doing this podcast almost five years and no one, every episode is just a snapshot in time. Like the things we were talking about that were going so well with meal planning and grocery shopping, like two and a half years ago, if we went back and listened to that, it would be different because we things, would laugh. So I like that. It's sort <laughs> yes. of like taking the temperature of, and, yeah. and I think it also gives you listeners out there just the, the reassurance that like everybody's always adjusting their systems. There is no single mom or family out there that's got it all figured out and they just stick with that system forever because that's not, not how it works. So I like to do this. So we're going to each share a couple of things that are working. Why don't you go first? Okay. Um, so like I hinted at before, um, with this tiny little kitchen, I've had to make a lot of changes to the way I shop and store food and plan meals. And I've gotten really good at some things. Like, so for example, I finally have gotten a real handle on leftovers. Um, I've realized I don't need to cook nearly as much as I do, Mm -hmm. um, or in the quantities that I cook in order, like if I continue to cook as many new meals as I do at the, at the quantities I used to, there will never be an opportunity to finish off the leftovers. Right. And it took me really having to shrink down into a place where there's room for, you know, six cans, not like a dozen cans mm-hmm. or whatever. I can't cook in the quantities I did unless I make a point to do it. And I've just gotten a lot better about saying, okay, tonight, you know, I made chili last night. There's still some in the pot. We're having it again tomorrow. Oh, guess what? There's still some in the pot. Now yeah. it's going like on nachos, like yeah. whatever it is. And I've been able to stretch meals for three days sometimes. Um, that's something I used to be really bad about doing. I always used leftovers and I would, I had creative ways to use them, but I would never use them to like the last dregs. And I've gotten good about that. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Do you as an eater, forget your kids and your family and, and the, all of that. As an eater, do you enjoy leftovers? Yeah, I don't care at all. Me neither. I could eat <laughs> <laughs> but I can eat the have... same thing all day long. Me too. I honestly don't care. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. <laughs> but the, we're, we're very similar, I think, in our I eating. Know. But um, some people have very strong feelings about they eat as much as they liked the original. They it's something they don't either don't care for the taste of, of rewarmed food or it's more of the psychology of like it's not they want the novelty. And I, I'm like you, I could eat the same. And because I work from home now and the kids are in school, I make very good use of leftovers for my lunches, even if we don't yeah. do them for dinner. So I yeah, love for leftovers. me, it's all about it's, for me. It's more that I just forget sometimes right. or like I just don't make the system. Um, I will also say that not having had a microwave really hurt, really hurt on um, the kids ability or I guess willingness to heat up food. So yeah. it's not like like I had to plan it all because they probably weren't going to take out a skillet and reheat yesterday's like pork tenderloin, yeah. right? Like so so something like that is going to only get easier. I think in the new house as long as I don't let having so much more fridge and cabinet space and cupboard space make me lazy on yeah. the rest of it and lead to so, food waste, which is yes, a, exactly. a potential, but you you're yeah. aware of that. Um, okay. So one thing that is working for us is honestly just family dinners sitting around the table, everyone eating roughly from the same thing that is served. I feel like the last year was a huge shift. And for those who aren't as familiar, my kids are turning seven. I think the day this airs, maybe happy birthday, Violet, Mm. uh, seven, nine and 11. And I, I think I, I alluded to this when we did our episode about table manners and um, I think when I talked to Megan and Stacy from Didn't I Just Feed You, I interviewed them about food. So I feel like I have mentioned this, but it's just worth celebrating that we sit down and we enjoy our family dinners. And it mm-hmm. took this long. And everything we talked about in the first half of the show, the conversation, the lingering, um, the trying new things and maybe not liking them, but not also not freaking out. I think I said in that interview with Megan and Stacy, I said, at least no one cries anymore when I put a plate in front of them. <laughs> like, I just feel like... Um, it's working and it took so long. And so it's worth, worth celebrating and worth telling it you is, all out it there. It is that, like pop the champagne yeah. because that is a big deal. And the nice thing is like, it really won't get it. it like it only gets better from here. Yeah. You know, it, you'll still have little moments, yeah. but like you'll never go back to that place where you've got kids crawling on the floor yeah. of the table yeah. again, once you're out of it yeah. for the most part. Yeah. Yes. Um, you're out of it. So that's great. Yes. Thank you. Um, so, so the next thing that's been working for me is my, current shopping plan. I've been using shipped, um, once a week on Friday or sometimes Saturday, depending on my schedule with the kids, um, for like well over a year. And I mean, I've got it down to a science, like I can get in shop sales, um, do my entire order. I just go through like what I used to. So shipped again is like a grocery delivery service. Mm-hmm. Do you do it, it on your shops. phone? I think I've asked I do you. It, I don't do it on my phone. I like doing it on my computer. Now there have been times I've done it on my phone, literally in 30,000 feet in the air. So yeah. <laughs> I will use my phone if I have to, 
but I really like having it on my computer screen so I can see everything and like see my order and it just it works better for me. Yeah. But you it it shops one of the bigger mega grocery stores around here. So you get a pretty good selection. And I just know now, like there's always there's always going to be certain things that are a little more expensive than they would be if I was buying them at the store. And there's things that like sometimes they're just always out of mm-hmm. like they've they've been out of the LaCroix I want consistently for like months now. So <laughs> I just know not to bother with that. Like I've I've really figured it out. Um, and I can do it really fast and I've been able to shave my, like shave the price down, down, down. But this is also a little bit of a doesn't work or want to slightly change. And I'll mm-hmm. get into that later when we talk about that. It's like, it's, it did its job and I've made the system work as well as it can. And I'm realizing it's just like, it still could use a little improvement. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, yeah. again, that's, that's how that's these reality, right? Go. Um, right. Well, my next thing that's working is also related to how and where I shop. And again, you were you led the way between the two of us of getting into grocery delivery um, because I I didn't have any reason for resisting. It just I don't mind going to the grocery store. And so it didn't like solve a particular problem for me. Um, But so here's what's working. I think in general, the way I shop for and stock food for breakfast and lunches. And I say breakfast and lunches because I I actually think our our dinner meal planning and the way we shop for that is still a work in progress. But for for our everyday pantry and refrigerator staples, I do Sunday morning early at Trader Joe's. And mm. that uh, the, the day of the week uh, really shifted over the last couple of years. But these Sunday morning early right when they open is lovely. There's not very many people there except the other early birds um, because everyone goes to church and then they go after and then it gets super crowded. But Sunday morning at Trader Joe's for the kids' lunches and our breakfasts. And I just feel like I know the exact amount that we'll use throughout the week. We're really doing well on like any kind of food waste or running out of things. Um, Their lunches, what I pack in their lunches, they're still liking their packed lunches. And we are January into the school year and they're not complaining. So I feel like um, that has worked really well. I I also do usually an Amazon fresh delivery later in the week for some things that Trader Joe's doesn't have. And just the cadence of those two things, I have very rarely recently felt like I'm out of things that the kids need for breakfast and lunch. And that hasn't always been the case. So that feels like it's working really well. So I just throwing out there that like when I move, I think I'm going to have two different right now. I just have one bin with snack food in it. Okay. And no matter how much I nag and how much I remind the kids that those are only for lunches. Yeah. I mean, stuff still disappears when they get snacky. Yeah. And I think my expectations have just been too high there. So I think what I'm going to do is have two. One is really like, here, this is the snack bin. You guys can get into it whenever you want and then hide yeah. the lunch stuff. Yeah. And I, you know, not hide it, but just put it out of sight. Like yeah. put it in a cabinet in the back, like in a, in a, in something with a lid. Cause mm-hmm. you know, kids aren't going to lift a lid to get a snack right. unless they have to. <laughs> um, I want to share something about grocery delivery that for all the moms of really little ones out there, I just want to quickly share the evolution <laughs> of my life as a grocery <laughs> shopping mom, because I think this will give people so much hope. So I was right there with many of you um, where I would be at the grocery store with two or sometimes three little children yep. under the age of five or six, a baby in the cart, a toddler in the cart, yep. and then whoever was trudging along beside and asking to sit in the cart. You yep. know, oh, yeah. You know there. And then that slowly, slowly started to peel off kids until I was down to just one. Yeah. It was Clara and had a really good time with her for like a year and a half. That was our mom and Clara time. And from the time she was like three, I think was when everybody else was in school. Yeah. And then when she got to be about four or five, I was able to leave her at home with the bigger kids and go to the store with no kids. And that felt like a miracle, mm-hmm. like going to the store kid free. And then I was able to, when they were all in school, I would do my grocery shopping at like three o'clock or like two thirty in the afternoon, right before they all started getting home from oh, school. Oh Yes. I remember <laughs> this. Yes. And what was so great about that is no one's in the store at that time. Uh-huh. And I would literally time it so that I was pulling up with the groceries <laughs> as the big boys were walking up to the house off the bus and then they would unload the groceries. So that was like the next step. And now when I have the groceries delivered, I make a point of not even being home when they're delivered it's the best. so that they have to put everything away. It is. Like, that is quite a timeline. That is. I will literally leave the house. I'll be like, oh, gosh, I got an errand I got to run. Or I'll be like, suddenly I have to take a shower. Oh, guys, ship is coming. Can you get the door? And they all just know to put it all away. So like I have gone from the spectrum where it was like the absolute most stressful and yes. worst to like now nothing. Like I do it on a computer and then it and magically... I don't even have to be there. 
Big Cubs. <laughs> it's amazing. This, I'm that just so happy is about seriously it. Seriously amazing. Okay, I have a really funny story that this is a, an unintentional way that I encouraged my family to help unload the groceries. Is one time I got really mad. I don't know why. Well, I don't know why I threw a little fit, but I had just been to the store and I came in and I was struggling with all the bags and everyone was just like doing Staying their around. thing, in- including <laughs> at that moment, my husband, who's so helpful and conscientious. And I think I said something like, if someone starts walking in with grocery bags, like overflowing, the only appropriate response is, would you like help? Like that is yes. from now on, that is your cue. And now when I come home and I, I think I was like super grumpy for some reason. You and got the crazy eyes. Now, and they're like, oh boy. Well, yeah, I got the crazy <laughs> eyes. And now they, even the kids, like when I get home from Trader Joe's on Sunday morning, that they come out. I think Brian actually kind of makes them. I think he tells yeah, them like when you hear the sure. garage door, you pop out there and you ask to carry a bag. <laughs> it takes a while to train them. It's but not like, my usual strategy for parenting is like lose well, your mind. You and know then, what? Yeah, it worked. Sometimes it works. Like sometimes that like, hey, you got the dummies. Yeah. Like you see what's going on here. Pay attention. <laughs> sometimes they need a little bit of that. And then it's like, oh, you know, it just gets their brains working yes. a little bit. So, yes, yeah, exactly. OK, so now we're going to talk about the things that need work. Um, I've got a couple. The first one is that I'm just spending too much. So mm-hmm. we talked about this um, a little bit with Shipped. I love Shipped. I really do love grocery delivery. But the fact is I tip pretty well on top of it. It is a little more expensive and it's a little indulgent. Like mm-hmm. I don't really need to have my groceries every single week delivered. It's just that I got in the habit of it mm-hmm. and the routine um, and it worked. But the other thing that I've been doing for the last, um, you know, two years since I've been in this tiny house is I do two shopping. Like I shop for family time, which is when the kids are with me. Mm-hmm. And then I usually have to run back out midweek to get stuff for me to eat the rest of the week. Mm-hmm. And I won't need to do that anymore because I will be able to just do one shopping trip and have enough space for everything for the whole week. Right. So, okay. So it was I, a space yeah. issue. I was, it was not a space following issue. there for a yep. second. Yeah. There really just wasn't enough room yeah. to keep food, all the food I would want. So I'm going to make a plan. And I think I really want to get back to Aldi. I mean, you just cannot beat it for pantry staples. Um, crackers and cereals and things like that. Bread. I mean, it's just such a great place for that. And I can stock up a little bit. I don't necessarily need to go to Aldi every week. Right. I could probably do that every other week, but then maybe do shipped every other week as well. Yeah. Um, I also can probably make more meat free or low meat meals. Sometimes I forget how easy it is to just make something with like black beans yeah. or, and I just, you know, meat has always been this kind of easy staple. You put it in the oven at two o'clock and let it roast all day. Mm-hmm. And like, and I, and there's dinner, but like, I really don't need to cook that way every day. And it does really get expensive, especially with teenage boys because they eat yeah. a lot of it. So there's lots of ways to make, um, dishes that have meat, but just stretch the meat mm-hmm. further. Like mm-hmm. soups and stews are really good for that. Um, but also just, there's definitely ways I could just cut it out of some meals entirely. And I don't even think anyone would miss it. So. Um, I was going to ask you, since you talked about spending, uh, a, I don't know, six months ago or so, you talked about your budgeting tool that you use. Are you mm-hmm. still using that? Is that how you know? How, how, what's your, how do you know you're spending more than you need to or spending more than you were? I'm using the budgeting tool, but also I can just tell. Yeah. Like, I know when I get that, I get, you know, I put in my shipped order and then I, and then what happens is like, you get prompted to leave a tip like the next time you log in. Mm-hmm. So mentally, I would just kind of like, pretend that didn't happen. (laughs) And then when I actually looked at my budget at the end and I said, oh, so I actually spent a hundred dollars more than I thought I did last month in this store. And then when I really started paying attention, um, to the other shopping I was doing, that was for me. Yeah. Cause those were kind of happening haphazardly or I was eating out cause I didn't have food in the house. Mm -hmm. That was another thing I was doing. And then I wasn't really comparing the eating out against the grocery budget right. and thinking how would that have been different right. um, really until I started really looking at my budget. Yeah. And well, I can see the difference when I shop more, I eat out less. It's just yep. the way it goes. Yeah, no, we're so. exactly the same. Um, and we will link to that episode where you talked about your budget and what, what's the tool called again? Just so people um, I think have... it was every, every dollar yeah. is the name of the budget. Yeah. So that. we'll link, yep. we'll link up to that episode as well. Okay. Well, I have something that's not working and it's really two things. I'll just do them both at once. I talked about how breakfast and lunches are working, how dinners are working. Two things that just still need a lot of help, especially as it relates to my kids eating is vegetables. They just Mm. are, they remain uninterested in most vegetables. (laughs) And it's kind of like, I think I got to a plateau where 
carrots and ranch or carrots and hummus or the occasional like roasted, uh, maybe roasted broccoli, like a couple of them like mushrooms occasionally, maybe sometimes. Yeah. And I kind of got to the point where it felt like, okay, that's fine. They eat a lot of fruit. Um, We don't eat a lot of processed food. So like they, they eat a lot of whole home cooked food. And that part I feel good about. But the actual quantity of vegetables that they eat is very pitiful, especially now when you consider, you know, I have an 11 turning 12, a nine turning 10. They're not, they, I feel like they should. And I'm using that word like in quotation marks. I just feel like it, they should be eating more vegetables. And I think I got kind of complacent because I got to this point where I'd, you know, I'd convinced myself it was fine, good enough, not something I was going to beat myself up over. Um, but I've just struggled for ways to cook with vegetables in a way that they like, but that also is a way Brian and I are going to want to eat. I mean, we do things Mm. like um, we will do like a pasta sauce where we take a jar of pasta sauce, but then Brian and I will add some like roasted veggies and make it kind of like, you know, a veggie sauce. And they might might eat something out of that, but it's very limited. So, yeah, I'm open to listener suggestions um, like yeah, I just, they just don't eat a lot of vegetables to be very honest. Um, yeah. And the other thing that I feel like needs an overhaul this year is snacks. And in part because meaning uh, they just don't eat a great variety of snacks and they, they don't eat the the best. I, I would like their snacking to have more variety and maybe uh, a little more nutrition. I know snacks aren't known for being nutritious, but, um, we do a lot of popcorn, a lot of pita chips. One issue I have, of course, is that schools, our schools are completely no nuts or nut products yeah, or that even makes it anything. really hard. It really doesn't. And, and I, I'm, I stand behind it a hundred percent. It's not, it's sure. nothing that I would put up a fight about, but from a, uh, snacking standpoint, they, they're kind of lukewarm, uh, pun intended on, on string cheese. Like they, they'll eat it out of the fridge, but then they kind of don't like when it's at school and it gets lukewarm. Yeah. Um, so I just, um, you know, cheese, I'm like racking my brain. Like what are other what dried fruit, maybe like Allegra likes dried blueberries. I just feel like our snacks could use an overhaul. And what it feels like in my brain is that there's like this whole category of snacks that I've forgotten about that maybe like I could just. Well, no, I think a lot of it is things like nuts and things that have nuts and then that's the problem. Like, and I'm totally also like, I totally understand why those rules exist, but it does create a challenge. Um, one thing that I think is really cool now that a lot of places are doing are those little mini guacamoles and hummuses. Yes. You've seen those. Like, mm-hmm. little we, snack and Trader size. Joe's has a snack size guacamole that Reed eats every day. So that's good. Yeah, he has that that's with good. Chips. Yeah. And Clara hates string cheese. In uh-huh. fact, there's a funny story where she came home from my friend Missy's house one time and told me, Missy tried to trick me. <laughs> she told me, because I think I used to give her cheese sticks uh-huh. and that's what she thought she was getting. Okay. And Missy gave her a string cheese and Clara said, she tried to trick me by giving me a string cheese. And then Missy called me and said, I don't know how I offended her so much. <laughs> It was pretty funny. She will eat the Colby Jack sticks. Okay. So that's worth a shot. Yeah. See, I always think of those as like, I lump them in the same category, although you're right, like a cheese stick or there's even, they'll do the little slices. Um, well, and they don't get so limp. Yes. Like string cheese gets very limp it's and very kind of limp. gross. And when it's, you know, and I think it just tastes weird. Yeah. Um, and I think those, those cheese cubes hold yes. up a little bit better. They, they, they hold their um, form a little yeah. bit better. And those are a big hit with my kids who don't like string cheese. Yeah. And this may be an area. I mean, I, you guys have heard me talk about prep dish and kind of changing my mind about weekend food prep. I think it's so, it's so great. Obviously don't do it every weekend, but I think I could probably with a little bit of time, uh, a prep ahead snacks, I could do things like, um, salami and cheese and crackers, Mm -hmm. like almost like a lunchable. Um, they do like that kind of thing. It's just not the kind of thing that I can reach in the pantry in the morning. So um, and yeah. I'm not just talking about school snacks. School snacks are a part of it. But even if we're home on the weekends or on a vacation, it just feels like, gosh, could there be any more gluten and butter? Right. Like, <laughs> bread and butter, bread and peanut butter. Right. You know, it's just even the snacks at home. And I'll feel like I'll put out some fruit, but I, I should put out the fruit first and just say, this is the snack right now. Snack. You know, yep. it just it just feels like it needs a little bit of an overhaul, especially they're going to just be eating more. I just, I, right. you know, they're bigger. Yes. The more they go. The nice thing is that they'll get good about things like egg salad like they'll, they'll yeah. get good about eating stuff that right now they're probably like no yeah <laughs> you know yeah hard boiled um, eggs are another good one they do like that I just forget I forget so yeah this is this is uh that my pep talk to myself it's to, pep a little more yourself. prep ahead on the protein snacks yeah love that um well I'll just make this last one really brief um and it's just that now that I'm moving into this house and I already touched on this but I really am looking forward to getting really serious about all of the things around my kitchen again that I have really not been for the mm-hmm. last couple of years out of necessity but just 
like buying in more bulk and being creative with meal planning and leftovers and including the kids more, just having them hang out with me. I, you know, the whole reason we're podcasting is that I had a podcast called the, Mo- the kitchen hour Yeah, all those years ago, not saying that's the only reason, but yeah. that was kind of what kicked it all off. And that was my fun time of the day. I really enjoyed hanging out in my kitchen with the kids coming in and out puttering yeah. and listening to podcasts. And, and I just haven't done that. And I'm really, that needs, needs work, but I'm also like, I, I feel very excited about it. So that's something you I'm are going like, to take back the kitchen. I am. I'm taking back the kitchen. I love it. I love it too. That's really exciting. Um, okay, everybody. Well, we will wrap up here, but just a reminder, um, check the show notes at the Uh, this is episode two forty four, or it should be right in the podcast app where you're listening for most of you. Just check, check right down there where you're listening. Um, And we will link up a bunch of other great episodes about food and feeding a family. We mentioned a few. We mentioned one about budgeting. We've done others that we didn't even mention today about grocery shopping and meal planning. So we have a whole bunch in the archives. And if you're new and you're just listening to our newer episodes that drop on Tuesday, this is a great way to kind of like, you know, go down a rabbit hole and kind of follow us back to some older oldies, but goodies. So we will link those up in the show notes and we will be back with you all soon with another new episode. Talk to you then. The Mom Hour is brought to you by partners like Chatbooks. Chatbooks makes it beyond easy to create beautiful photo books by importing your digital photos from anywhere, Instagram, Facebook, Google Photos, or directly from your phone. The books come in a variety of sizes with beautiful cover options and binding styles to choose from, and they start at just $15. Plus, we have a great deal just for our listeners. Use code THEMOMHOUR20 to save 20% off your purchase. Just download the Chatbooks app and use code the Mom Hour 20 to save 20%. Hi, everyone. Megan here. Sarah and I would absolutely love it if you would hit pause right now, like right where you're listening, and leave the Mom Hour a rating and review. If our show has helped you feel a little more confident as a mom or a little less alone, this is one of the biggest ways you can thank us, and it really only takes about 30 seconds. If you're listening to Apple Podcasts, you can navigate to the Mom Hour's show listing. So when you're in the episode you're listening to right now, click where it says the Mom Hour just above the play button and then scroll all the way to the bottom and you will see the ratings and reviews. We would love if you would leave us one as well. Thank you so much for listening.